Good day, and so good to be here, here with you again. And thank you for the, who knows, 100th time for inviting me in your uh, places and spaces. And I really mean that. I thank you. I know I made it sound like trivial, but it's not. To me, it's, it's so such a blessing that you would spend even a few minutes uh, hearing me out and hearing what, what uh, God has brought to us today. So I just really want to dive into the deep end of the pool, so to speak. Really want to give you a challenge right off the bat, right off the bag, and maybe right off the, the bat. I mean, and maybe it's going to be too much to start with, but uh, 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 I guess we'll have to do that anyways. So a couple questions for you: Does the grace of God mean that you and I can ignore what the Bible says to be or to do? Does the grace of God mean that our obedience and zeal for God, our work for God, well, as someone said, quote, woo the heart of heaven? How would you answer these questions? Because you see, whatever your answer is, you will reveal your understanding concerning the grace of God. And your understanding of God's grace will be made manifest, will be revealed in your life in one way or another. As I was pondering these questions myself, thinking about human nature, our human nature, thinking about those kinds of things, it came to me how astonishing how one can think that there is something about our human nature, something about ourselves that surely must be okay. It's the idea that I am a good person, and as a good person, I do good things, so there must be something good about me. Maybe in one sense that's true. But if there's something good I can bring to God, and that God would be pleasing to God, and this would be pleasing to God. Or considering the grace of God, we act like it's a license. You know, free to do whatever we want, with whoever we want, wherever we want, whenever we want. After all, God's grace covers all the areas of my life. God's grace is a pass to all the venues, all the places, all the excitement and stimulation the world offers its citizens. Well, behind these questions is the underlying assumption that grace is, as author Scott, Scott Hubbard suggests, quote, a thing. You know, something that we can carry around in our pockets like a trusty jackknife, pocket knife, and pull it out whenever we need it. Well, Husber, Hus, Hubbard would disagree with you and me if we said that. He said, grace is not a thing. Or we understand grace, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, quote, chief grace is grace without Jesus Christ, living and incarnate. So what is it, this grace of God? And do we bring something to the table, for example, in our salvation? And is the grace of God in Christ a license to do whatever we want? Well, please turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2 as we continue our study of the letter to the Ephesians by the, the Apostle Paul, uh, verse by verse, for as many weeks as it takes us to get through all this. Starting in chapter 2, verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches, immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. So, Father, we thank you all for the day that we can come in these places and these spaces. 
and hear from you, from your word, and as we can pray here together. Uh, I thank you for each person uh, watching and listening. And wherever they are, Lord, I ask your blessing on them. And help us, Lord, as we look at this word a little closer, a little deeper, by your spirit to uh, grasp the, the width and the breadth and the depth and the wonders of it, not only for our individual lives, but the lives, the lives of our churches and the churches that we belong in. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your great love for us. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, when we began our study of Ephesians, uh, we discovered Paul there in that first chapter. And we'll be spending a few minutes there so you can flip to chapter 1. Paul there in that chapter had set the tone of the letter and it was a tone of praise to God. And he was praising God for the church at Ephesus. He had begun by addressing the believers in, in Ephesus there in the first chapter as saints. That is, a people that were sanctified, people that were set apart to God, who were, according to Paul in verse 1 there of chapter 1, faithful in Christ. And Paul went on to praise God for every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places that were bestowed upon the believers in Ephesus, that God chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that God had predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ. That's chapter 1, verse 5. That God's blessings are a result of our union, or a believer's union, with Christ. That's chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 6. And all this, Paul would say, was according to the purpose of his will, the purpose of God's will. And that continuing attitude of praise, as we move through that chapter really quick here, Paul, of all the apostles, would have understood so well what it meant to be redeemed when he, we consider his life, when he considered his life, and as we know of his life in the, in the Bible. And he praised God that in him, that is in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of what? Of our sins. And this according to the riches of his grace which God, Paul said, lavished, poured out on Paul in the Ephesian church. And by the way, you and me as well. This overture of praise continues in that chapter. And he would say that God in all his wisdom and insight had made known to us the mystery of his will. And that word mystery, my friends, if you remember, and if you don't, I'll just remind you, does not mean a, a puzzle that we find to fit into a piece of the puzzle that we put in our puzzle that we're trying to discover. No, this was the mystery of the knowledge of God. And, and it says here, he had made known to us a mystery of his will. And what God's purpose was to do this through what? His son, Jesus Christ, verse 9, chapter 1. And that one day in God's time, he will unite all things in Christ. Unite all things. And Paul would go on that the saints have obtained an inheritance and this was all was according, and this was according to the purpose of God's will, who works out all those things according to his will. Chapter 1, verse 11. And that those who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, and believed in him, all these God had sealed and will seal with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 1, verse 13. And God's seal of the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of the saints' inheritance today and in fullness of time to come. Now, isn't that just amazing? That's how we started this study, this series, Ephesians Blueprint. How awesome and really how humbling all that God has done for the believers in Christ, for you and me. And Paul would say in chapter 1, verse 14, this was all to the praise of his glory. Well, here we are now in our text in chapter 2. And Paul here continue to unpack the wonders of God's gracious grace, as he calls it in chapter 1, verse 5. And as Paul often does in his letters, when you look at these 10 verses here, he uses a contrast in order to make his point. And in this, age, in this case, concerning the riches of God's grace that he talks about in chapter 1, and the greatness of God's love here in chapter 2. He brings the, he brings the Ephesian believers back in time probably not too far back in time, to another time. And we see this in verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sin. We find a similar contrast here in verse 5, where Paul said there, even when we were dead in our trespasses, 
Key word there is now he's using the plural personal pronoun we to include all believers, which, of course, would include you and me. We see another example of this contrast in Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. There Paul reminding them that before God had made the Colossian believers alive in Christ, they were what? They were dead in their trespasses, Colossians 2, 13. So he brings them back to a different time than they were when he wrote this letter. Well, let's get it in the time machine then, talking about time, and fast forward from the time of Paul's letter, which is around 60, somewhere between 60 and 62 AD, all the way to the 5th century. The location that we're in now is Rome. It's in the early years of the 5th century. We find a fellow there by the name of Pelagius, and he had been contemplating how many, so many Roman citizens had no interest in morality and piety. Now, Pelagius himself was a a British-born lay monk. And as he was contemplating what he was seeing and experiencing in Rome, he came to the conclusion that the influence of another Christian leader, Augustine, and his teaching regarding God's grace was the problem. And it's interesting that even in his own expression of, of a high morality and piety, he would gather people around him and there began teaching things concerning the Bible that were not true, concerning grace that were not true. For example, he said that the biblical doctrine of original sin was to be denied. That every person for Pelagius is born morally neutral, for we are able to sin, but also able not to sin. For Pelagius, humans fall into sin by choosing to do what Adam did, and people would be saved if they followed the example of Jesus. So Jesus became, for Pelagius, a moral example. So the question is, because we're on the topic of God's grace, what about God's grace? Well, Pelagius would say, yes, that is helpful, but not necessary for eternal life. See, a person's free will, according to Pelagius, is enough. Now, uh, biblical inerrancy, thank thank the Lord, was prevailing, and Pelagius was... um, officially excommunicated at two of the early church councils in the 400s. But as it often happened in history, right, all along Christian history, it didn't take long before a new heresy showed up and was introduced, and we call that heresy that followed Pelagius semi-Pelagianism. And it goes something like this. This heresy teaches that salvation is a cooperative effort between God's grace and and human free will. This was also officially condemned and has traditionally, even up to this day, been opposed. Yet when you can think about our culture, you think about what's going on in the world around us today, this whole idea, this cooperative position is clearly the position that would be attractive to the culture and to unbelievers today. And without giving you any stats, no time to dive into this too deeply, If you did a general survey of the teachings and practices of of, uh, churches today, many churches today, uh, semi-Pelagianism is alive and active. Uh, So, you might be asking yourself, why the history lessons, Pastor? Well, I have two reasons for this. One, to highlight that there's nothing new under the sun when it comes to Satan's efforts to undermine the inerrancy and authority of the Bible of the teaching of the Bible. Two, to reinforce Paul's comments in our text regarding our human nature and the working of God's grace in our lives. See, the question was asked at the start. Do do we bring something to the table in regards to our salvation? Do we bring something to the table? Now, why don't we let Paul answer that for us right here in these first verses of chapter 2. We see Paul there saying, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked in. That's in verse 1 and 2. And the word dead in the ESV, that's translated dead here in the ESV, means in context, quote, "to, to being so morally or spiritually deficient as to be dead. So morally and spirit, so morally and spiritually deficient as to be like you were dead. You know, friends, dead people stay dead. 
you check out the local graveyard. And it's only in the movies that the dead get to crawl back out of the graves. See, Paul asks that not only were you and I without spiritual life, we were dead spiritually. He goes on to say we marched to the drumbeat of the culture. And we were powerless to resist it. We kept in step with the world system. According to Paul, this world system is following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Verse 2. Hence my first point. There's nothing new under the sign, sun regarding the devil's attempt, Satan's attempt, to undermine doctrine, biblical doctrine, solid biblical doctrine. And as we, in that time, danced the two-step along with everyone else, Paul said we all lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. Friends, we desired and we participated in forbidden things. Things that satisfied the desires of our sinful human nature. And indeed, like Paul and the Ephesians were at one time, we were sons of disobedience as well. Verse 2. We were without spiritual power, powerless to do anything about it. And Paul would go on to say here in this uh, second chapter, we were separated from Christ. That's down in verse 12. You see, my friends, the unregenerate person is spiritually destitute, spiritually impoverished, spiritually bankrupt. And in this state of spiritual bankruptcy, we were, as Isaiah the prophet put it, like sheep gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way. Isaiah 53, 6. So we were without spiritual life, Paul's saying here, powerless to do anything about it, separated from cross, Christ. But Paul would go on here. He would say that we were also without promise. We are one time, according to verse 12 here, strangers to the covenants of promise. And if you think about that, the carnal, Christless person would see no benefit in the promises of God. So without spiritual life, without power, Christless, without promise, and this left us with no hope and without God in the world. Verse 12 again. So when I ask the question, what does Paul mean without God in the world? Well, let's start by listening to how Jesus described himself in John's Gospel. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. My friends, you and me, like Paul and like the Ephesian believers, at one time were without Christ and could not come to God in the matter that he had appointed in eternity past. And how did he, and how, what manner did he appoint? How did he decide that would happen? Well, it would only be through Christ, who already we learned is the only way, the only truth, the only life. This is where we were at one time. This is where the Ephesian believers were at one time. This is where Paul was at one time. We were without spiritual life, we we're powerless, Christless, without promise, with no hope, and without God. Well, if you think about all this and let it really get in there and knock you around a bit, I think Paul has concisely and appropriately answered our question. What do we bring to the table when it comes to our salvation? Answer, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Well, chapter 2 started with the, with the phrase, and you. In verse 1, now in verse 4, verse 4, pardon me, verse 4, I've got to take a drink. It's been a long day. Verse 4 starts with, but God. So now Paul turned his focus back onto God. And we read verse 4, but God, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. And we'll stop there. See, before Paul, Paul plays the grace key again, he shows us here the reason for God's grace. Here we have, in verse 4, that first part of it, the reason for God's grace. And it's all bound up in the character and nature of God. So who, what is God like? That's the question we ask now. Is God, as some say, the, the man upstairs, as if God lives in the attic of our homes or someplace, and we can go upstairs with a cup of tea and some biscuits, hoping to get some good advice for the day? 
What is God like? Well, according to our text here, God is rich in mercy. Rich in mercy. God, King David said this, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That's Psalm 103, verse 8. The author of Lamentation said this, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. My friends, God is rich in mercy, and great is his love, which verse 4 tells us, in which he loved us. Great is his love in which he loved us. It is the merciful and loving God who has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. Verse 4. But God made us alive together with Christ. Verse 5. But God. Remember those two words. Paul in his Colossian letter, chapter 2, verse 13, said this. God made us alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Verse 5 here in Colossians 2, 13, speaking again of our union with Christ because of God's rich mercy and great love. Why, did, why do we have grace, God's grace? Because of God's rich mercy and great love for us, for all people. And with this as mine, Paul said, by grace you have been saved. And that word grace here meaning the unmerited favor of God applied to you and me, to a person once dead in their sins that now has been made alive, for by grace you have been saved through faith. faith. Verse 8. So back to our question. One more time. What do we bring to the table when it comes to our salvation? Paul answers it here for us. In verse 8 and 9, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. No one may boast. Well, we, uh, we're back on our time machine. It's 1980, and country music star Mac Davis recorded a song called It's Hard to Be Humble. And it starts off with these kinds of lyrics. Quote, O Lord, it's hard to be humble when you are perfect in every way. I can't wait to look in the mirror because I get better looking every day. Well, <clears throat> Paul, when dealing with the sin of pride that he's addressing in Corinthian church in his first letter, contrasts there in that letter the wisdom of God and the power of God as he does here in a different way in Ephesians. And he exhorted the Corinthian believers to consider their calling from God. How compared to the powerful of the day, the elite of the day, the important ones of the day, the wealthy of their day, those that uh, felt they had it made in shade with the Kool-Aid of his day, they were without power and certainly not of any noble birth, birth themselves. Yet God had chosen what he describes in that letter as the foolish to shame the world who thought of themselves as wise. God had chosen the weak to shame the strong. God had chosen what, who was, uh, what was despised to and low in their world. Why? So that no human being might, be, might boast in the presence of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18 and 31 will fill you in on all what I just said. See, at the core of what Paul was dealing, at least from what I'm reading here in the Corinthian church, was sinful human pride. Sinful human pride. The kind of pride that we can express in so many ways. The origin which is found in our human nature, which born into sin desires autonomy from God, desires self-determination and, and self-sufficiency. God's grace, my friends, is not a thing to take out of our pockets to use when we need it. God's grace is not found in your pocket or my pocket. You and I were never interested let me just say this out loud. You, you and I were never interested in, in God until God's grace opened our spiritually dead eyes. Until God's grace surgically removed our stone hearts and replaced our hearts with a living, beating heart for the things of God. My friend, God breaks into a person's life but God. And that was the condition of the believers in Ephesus and Paul. They had been and 
at one time, but now but God. The believer has been revived. They had been revived. You and I have been revived if we are believers of Christ. The believer now lives a holy spirit, regenerated life. It's a new life, a new creation. The believer has gone from death to life. It's from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And the sin that once separated a person from the life of God has been put away because they are now in Christ. Once they were far off, but now they have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The Ephesians, my friend, you and me have been raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 6. The Apostle John, his gospel, describing the last moments of Jesus' life. And as Jesus was dying, uh, Jesus said, uh, it is finished. It is finished. John 19, 30. My friends, you and I are living in the time of but God. And we can rest in Christ. We can rest in all that Christ has done for it is finished. And until Jesus returns, you and I, all believers in this world, have work to do. It tells us here in verse 10 that God has prepared this work beforehand and that we should walk in it, walk in them. My friends, if you are in Christ Jesus, you are God's workmanship. Pelagius got this wrong, as many have today. It's all God's doing. By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Well, my friends, I just want to close with a retell a story told by uh, Pastor Chuck Swindoll, probably a long time ago. So this is the retelling of his story that he told. There was a bazaar which held, a, held in a village in northern India. Everyone brought his wares to trade and sell. Uh, one old farmer brought in a whole covey of quail. He had tied a string around one leg of each bird. The other ends of all the strings were tied to a ring, which fit loosely over a central stick. He had taught the quail to walk dolefully in a circle around and around like mules at a sugarcane mill. Nobody seemed, in, nobody seemed interested in buying the birds until a devout Braham came along. He believed, believed in the Hindu idea for all life, so his heart of compassion went out to, to those poor little creatures walking in their monotonous circles. I want to buy them all, he told the merchant who was elated. After receiving the money, he was surprised to hear the buyer say, Now I want you to set them free. What's that, sir? You heard me. Cut the strings from their legs and turn them loose. Set them all free. With a shrug, the farmer bent down and snipped the strings off the quail. They were freed at last. What happened? The birds simply continued marching around and around in a circle. Finally, the man had to shoo them off. But even when they landed some distance away... They resumed their predictable march. Free, unfettered, released, yet they kept going around in circles as if tied. And so Noel concludes his story by saying this, Until you give yourself permission to be the unique person God made you to be, and to do the unpredictable things grace allows you to do, you'll be like that covey of quail, marching around in vicious circles of fear and timidity and boredom. Since the strings have been cut, it's time to stop marching and start, start flying. Let us pray. Our Lord and God, we thank you uh, for this wonderful letter that was written so long ago to a church so long ago, but so, so real to us today. Help us, Lord, to understand the depth and the width and the height of your love, your great love for us, for the world. That your son would die on the cross for the sin of the world, for my sin, for whoever's listening and watching their sin. That we understand the ramifications of that, not only in our lives, but in the lives of our families, in our communities, in the world around us. That we won't be like Bonhoeffer said, walking in cheap grace. Or thinking that we are so worthy of something that we, we can get that grace on our own terms. No, Lord, it's your terms or no terms at all. It's you're the Lord and 
we are not. You are the king, we are not. You're the savior, we are not. Your love is greater than any love that we can ever bear or carry. And we thank you for that. And we ask now, Lord, as we stop here and move on, that you would fill us with your spirit and put the message of the gospel on our lips and in our hands and our feet, we will love others in any way that we can, irrespectful of who they are and where they're from. May we do that, Lord, for your honor and glory, we pray. Amen. Thanks so much. Again, God bless you. Shalom.